in prisoners' chains.
Father, we are so blessed this morning, Lord, to be in your house. God, to be with brothers and sisters in the faith. Lord, to be able to proclaim the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Lord, to which one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to your glory. Lord, it's a privilege to be in your house. Lord, you poured out your spirit upon us. And, and God, we just want to say thank you. Lord, this morning as we stand here, Lord, as we bless your name, Father, would you pour out a blessing upon us and, Lord, fill our homes with peace and strength and wisdom and grace. And, Lord, may we sense you leading our families, Lord, and you going before us and preparing the way. Lord, we need you. We need you every step of this life. And, God, today as we stand here, Lord, we just uh, humbly ask, uh, Lord, for your blessing, and even as we ask, we say thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Great to have Gordon back too, isn't it? Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Well, I want to especially welcome our guests and uh, family, and it's a privilege to be here together with you, and we pray that you sense God speak into your heart and your life today, amen, that you sense the Lord's presence, that maybe there's a word that, that you need to hear, and, and we pray that God would speak that into your heart, into your mind this morning as we are gathered in praise and worship to Him, and and uh, we just trust that God is at work in all of our lives, amen, that he will never leave us nor forsake us, and he's faithful, faithful. Well, this morning, I want to talk about the Sabbath, the Sabbath, and of course, we're unique in uh, Christendom to a large extent, right? There's others, but uh, to go to church on Saturdays is, is something unique, and I want to talk about why I believe, why I am convicted, and why the church has a long history of keeping or going to church on Saturdays. What's the reason behind that? And more importantly, what's the Bible say, right? What does the Bible say about this issue of Saturday or Sunday, Sabbath? What does it say? But, you know, as I begin and as I think about this topic, I, I realize that I need to begin with some affirmations. I need to be clear in, in, in some things. Um, it, you know, it's one of those things that sometimes you get into a, a little bit of a dif difficult topic and, and you want to say, well, here's what I'm not saying, right? And uh, that's part of this, this affirmations that we'll begin with and then we'll get into more of the topic. One is that the Sabbath, I believe and am convicted, that is the truth, but I realize that not everybody understands it the way I do. Right? Not all of God's people understand it the way that I do. And so we are called to grace. We are called to grace. Look at this passage that, that we, as, we as Sabbath keepers often have to wrestle with. Romans 14, 5 and 6. And this is part of the Word of God and we have to wrestle with it. And we have to answer, you know, what is this saying? But look at this uh, verse. It's a little bit small this week. I apologize for that. It says, one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind, he who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. And it's not really the, my intent to unpack this whole passage where this verse, these verses are found, but it is a context of dealing with um, weak brothers in the faith, and and I want you to just notice that in this passage, it says this, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. And as I read that, as I think about this, this instruction, let each be fully convinced in his own mind, I think to myself, who's going to be doing the convincing? Right? Is it going to be my own reasoning, my own understanding, or is it going to be the Word of God? And so I hear within the Scripture not a call to confusion, but really a call to clarity. And as we go from confusion or a lack of understanding to understanding, what I see in this scripture is a call to grace, is a call to extend grace and love 
and patience and all of those things. And so I see within this, this passage a call to clarity, to f- be fully convinced in your own mind, not by your own thinking, but to go back to the Word of God and, and look at what the Word of God says. What does God's Word say on this topic? What does He say? Let me be fully convinced, not by my own reasoning, but by the Word of God. And that's what I hear in this. And in, in between, that, in that journey, there is a call to grace. There is a call to understanding. And what I'm saying is, is that as we begin this, this topic of Sabbath and, and talking about it, I want to affirm that I see the Holy Spirit at work, mightily at work, in those who don't understand it the way that I do. Amen? I remember when I was 12 years old, I ran into a Christian artist, um, not, not uh, personally, not, but through the music, and uh, he had such a powerful anointing on his life. God used him in a mighty way. He was a teacher. He was a songwriter. Uh, he ministered in that way. And as a young person in my journey with the Lord, God used that individual to minister to my spirit. And I recognize that the Holy Spirit rested upon him and filled his life and that God used him to minister to me and to develop me spiritually even though he didn't understand the Sabbath the way that I do. And so I want to affirm that uh, this morning. That I see God's work in the lives of those that don't understand it the way I do or the way the church understands it. And isn't it true that we're called to recognize that we are all growing in grace and knowledge? Amen? We're all growing in grace and knowledge. I think about, we, you know, the New Testament and some of the struggles that went on uh, in the church. And uh, Apollos was, the word says, was a mighty man in word. And Aquila and Priscilla came and they took him aside and they explained to him the way of God more perfectly. Here was a man who was mightily used of God. God was speaking through him and yet he didn't understand all the truth. And that's really where we all are at. We don't understand everything. And so God has given us people in our lives to help us understand and and we're called to understand the scriptures in a greater way. I can think about the Corinthian church, how they had many struggles, right? They were suing each other. They were dividing up into different, uh, we would call them today, denominations almost. Um, they, some didn't believe in the resurrection. Uh, they were misusing the gifts of the Spirit. They had confusion at the Lord's Supper, right? They were growing in grace. And so Paul writes to them and he, and he lays out some of these different things uh, that, they were, that they needed to work on. And I'm going to borrow an analogy uh, from a sister in the Lord um, then she probably borrowed it some way, somewhere. But sometimes we think of truth as a ladder, right? Where we step on the rung and then we go next step and next step and next step. And really truth isn't, isn't like that because, you know, we, we understand things. Uh, we understand a rung of the uh, ladder at different times. It's not always the first one, right? Somebody might understand something that I don't understand. That may be a part of their journey when they're first a Christian. And I may not learn it for decades, Right? And truth is, is not so much a, a, this picture of, of these rungs on a ladder, but more like a puzzle where the pieces are coming together. And so I want to affirm as I begin that not, under, uh, that not all of God's people understand it the way that I do or the way that the church teaches. Number two, having said that, I want to say that the Sabbath is part of the plan of God. It's part of the plan of God. It's part of living life abundantly. Though not everybody understands it, still it is important. Still it is important. I believe that it's designed to be a blessing of rest and renewal, a framework of fellowship and a catalyst to worship, which I'll, by God's grace, unpack that as we go further. Let me say that again. Sabbath is designed to be a blessing of rest and renewal, a framework of fellowship, and is a catalyst to worship. You know, one thing that hits me is that Satan knows the importance of Sabbath. And through his cunning, he has robbed 
the modern day church of Sabbath. And I'm talking about Christendom in general, right? Ask your grandpa how things have changed in society. How there used to be a pause and now it's 24-7, 365. Satan in his cunning has robbed the church, and I'm saying Christendom in general, not just Church of God Seventh Day, but Christendom in general. Satan has robbed the church of Sabbath. And it's interesting that the spiritually astute are recognizing it. And again, this is across denominational lines. This isn't something that's just happening within our church group. I want you to hear what a lady, uh, Priscilla Schreier, uh, said. And and if you don't know her, she was actually the actress in the movie War Room. And uh, she's a speaker. She's a teacher. She ministers to women. She has kind of a women's ministry focus. And uh, as far as I know, she's, she's not a Sabbath keeper as we would, we would define that. But she recognizes the importance of Sabbath. And I want to read something that she said. Hear, hear this. She says, one of the greatest challenges among women in our culture is taking time to stop and cease from all the activities and busyness and just breathe. We are in bondage to busyness. We constantly s- strive to complete the limitless to-do lists that hinder us from experiencing all that God has for us. We miss the moments because we rush ahead to the next thing. By by neglecting time for tranquility, serenity, and repose, we limit our Christ-likeness and miss out on some of God's greatest gifts. Do you hear her heart? It is time for us to breathe and to build margin into our lives for God. In the Old Testament, God instituted principles and laws that would transform the Israelites' mindset. He didn't just want them legally free. He wanted them to be able to walk in the freedom and enjoy it. So God gave them many gifts, including boundaries in which to enjoy those gifts. Sabbath was intended as a gift, and it is still a gift to us today. If we are weary, worn out, and exhausted, the concept of Sabbath will change your life. And I so appreciate that, hearing that from another perspective besides the church that I'm a part of. I love hearing that. I love hearing the recognition that's coming from Christendom at large of the need to build margin in our life that allows space for worship, that allows space for rest, that allows space for renewal that gives us a break from that limitless to-do list, which I have, my to-do list is limitless. Because every time I try to pare it down, it just grows. I can totally relate to that. Satan knows that when we remember the Sabbath, we are putting place guards in place, safeguards for preserving this incredible gift and blessing. Satan knows the power of Sabbath, and so he comes to take it. I'm reminded of John 10.10, that the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy, right? And praise God, Jesus said, I come to, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. One of those blessings that Satan seeks to take from us is Sabbath, is coming together week to week, of which we are commanded to assemble, right? Look at this passage in Hebrews 10. It'll be in front of you. It says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know, isn't it true that we're stronger together? Amen? We're stronger together. Just consider for a moment what the church is about. We're about fellowship, right? We're about worship. We're about discipleship. This is what we are called to do to come as we come together, right? We're called to worship, fellowship, serve one another, to be a blessing, to receive a blessing, to be a blessing. What are these things? These are things of eternity. These are things that that God has, has written into not just this moment, in which we live in this world. But these are things that are eternal. These are the things that God has for us in the kingdom. Worship, right? Fellowship, learning, 
Absolutely. These are the things of life. This, these are the things that the church is about. So let me affirm that while not under, everybody understands it, the Sabbath is part of God's plan. Number three, I want to affirm that Sabbath is not to be used as a litmus test to those who belong to God and those who don't. We are to recognize and embrace our brothers who understand it differently. What my challenge is, is let's enjoy this gift that God has given us while avoiding the trap of falling into the trap of judging those Christians who don't understand the Sabbath day the same that we do. And this is not to say that it's multiple choice, right? It's not multiple choice. If you do understand it, if you do see it, if you are convicted of it, you are to do it, right? Amen? If you're convicted of it, if you understand it, if that's the way you see it, you're to do it, right? The Word of God says in James... Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. I'm reminded of the challenge of never to assign weights to the will of God. If we understand something, just do it, right? Even if it seems like something small to us. It can be even something as small as a piece of fruit on a tree, right? Well, that doesn't seem like a big deal to take a, to take a piece of fruit and take a bite of it. But look at the consequences. Look at the ramifications of that small decision. And I would just encourage us, never put weight on the will of God. If you understand something a certain way that God is calling you that way, do it, right? Whatever is not of faith is sin, the Word of God tells us. I'm reminded that, that you know, if, if we are in that trap of where we assign weights to the will of God and we think well that's you know that that's not that important I'm going to just put that aside God will deal with us as children right the word of God tells us that we are his children and as a father chastises us or as a father chastises his ch child so the father chastens us in our walk with the Lord and I've been there and I'm sure that that you would say the same thing that the Lord will get into our business at times right and he will admonish us and correct us and chasten us. And so let me go back to the, the topic of the Sabbath. As, as I've made those affirmations, and hopefully you've, hopefully you've heard what I've said from the heart and, and that it's been clear, but let me just talk about why I'm convicted of the Sabbath and, and why the church has a rich tradition in in remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And, and more importantly, what does the Bible say, right? Take everything I say and take it and measure it against the Word of God. The first thing I want to say is that Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man. Was made for man. Look at this in Mark 2.27. The context is, is this battle going on uh, between Jesus and the Pharisees. Uh, Pharisees had a incredibly onerous interpretation of what the Sabbath meant. And uh, they added some things to it. And uh, they were very unspiritual people. And they were, we would call them legalists, right? And Jesus was constantly having these battles uh, between him and the Pharisees over this issue of the Sabbath and how to keep it. And this is the context in which Jesus says that the Sabbath was made for man. And I think that we just need to look at Jesus' response for a moment and realize that Jesus, as he dealt with the Pharisees, he corrected them and he confronted them, right, about the Sabbath, but he didn't remove or repudiate the Sabbath. And I think that's significant. I think as we look at these, these, these battles that went on, if I can call them that, between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day, Jesus sought to correct their interpretation, even to rebuke them, even to challenge them, but he didn't remove the Sabbath. He didn't repudiate the Sabbath. And I think that's significant. When they, uh, when they plucked some grains of head, heads off the wheat, uh, Jesus began to talk about how David was hungry and David ate the showbread, the, the bread that was only for um, the priests. And Jesus began to 
to parallel the law of the Sabbath and, and, and weight it against the needs of people, right? And uh, they got so concerned and, and wrapped up that Jesus would heal on the Sabbath. Most, if not all, of his healings were on Sabbath, right? And so they, they, they confronted Jesus, and Jesus confronted them. And Jesus said, you go and you, you water your animal. You pull your sheep out of the ditch. Why shouldn't I heal someone, right? And really what he says is, what better day to heal than on the Sabbath? And so Jesus confronts their narrow, legalistic approach that just focused on rules, and he expanded it to, to seeing the Sabbath as a gift, to seeing the Sabbath as a day of healing, as a day of meeting, as a day to celebrate. And I think we realize that Jesus, really what he's doing is he's taking on this list mentality, this list of rules that the Pharisees were known for. He's really taking that head on because Jesus knew that a list mentality would not fit in the new, under the new covenant. And I ask this question, if it was to be erased from Christendom practice, why was there this illumination of the Sabbath that Jesus gave? Why was there so much, when we look at the Gospels and we think about how small those four books are, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we see the volume of, that's written between the conflicts between the Pharisees and Christ about this issue of the Sabbath, we think of the volume as a percentage, right? And I haven't done the math, so I don't know what it is, but there's a lot in there. And I think if it was to be something that was to be erased from Christendom, why would there be this information in the Gospels? I want you to notice this, this verse again that says that it was made for man. One of the things that you will often hear is that it's the Jewish Sabbath. That it's for the Jews. And yet Jesus uses an interesting word here, this word man, this word in the Greek, anthropos. And it, as it's in front of you, it, it refers to human beings, males and females, Right? It doesn't refer to the Jews. It refers to humanity. And Jesus is saying the Sabbath was made for humanity. Not narrowing it down to a certain group of people, but he was saying it was given to humanity. Let's go back to Genesis 2. Genesis 2, 1 to 3. Let's look at this scripture. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. I want you to imagine the scene. I mean, with our small brains, right? Try to imagine the scene of six days of indescribable, incredible creation of the universe coming into existence by the very word of God. Incredible to think about the work that God was doing. And he did. And he spoke it into existence. And he made all this, this universe that they've never found the end to, right? They refocus the Hubble telescope and they realize that it's bigger. They refocus and it's bigger. Infinite, billions and billions and billions upon stars and galaxies. And if you've ever watched some of the YouTube videos, you realize that some have tried to put, put it together uh, to show it to scale. And it's, it is mind-boggling. And God in six days, spoke it into existence, the Word of God says. And, and the Bible says, by faith, we believe that. We weren't there. We take it by faith. And now God is finished. God rests. And in wisdom, God does one final act. He blesses this day that he rests on. He sanctifies it. He sets it apart as sacred, as holy. 
as a special day to reflect upon not just creation, but upon creator. And nothing has ever changed that. Nothing has ever changed what God did at creation, that he blessed the seventh day. And let me ask you this. Can you imagine it any other way? That God created this incredible universe. Can you imagine it any other way that there wouldn't be a day of pause, a day of worship, a day of reflection? I can't imagine it. It's so appropriate, isn't it? To consider not just creation, but creator. Creator, look at God what you did. Let's worship, right? Creation is not to be rushed over. Look at these next two verses in Psalms and Job. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Have you ever done that? Have you ever just gone out on a dark night and gazed into the stars? It's overwhelming to look into the heavens and just to as your brain starts to twirl a little bit, right? And you contemplate the size and the scope and how small we are. Reflect on God. The word tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. You know, to rush over God's creation with no, with no reflection would really be like the, the birth of a nation, like the United States with no 4th of July. It would be like a marriage with no anniversary. These moments, these times are important. They give, uh, they give us a chance to look back and to reflect and consider. That's what the Sabbath was designed for, was reflection. And the Sabbath was not a divine oversight, right? was not a divine afterthought. It was perfectly placed to pause and consider the wondrous works of God. I hope you can grasp that. I hope you can capture what God was after as he did this one final act of sanctifying and declaring this day, this seventh day upon which he rested sacred. And so we can say it like this. Sabbath is not just about rest, but it's an opportunity to worship It's a God moment to see and reflect upon the finished work of God and rejoice. Again, Psalms 19 says the heavens declare the glory of God. And in this moment, in this moment of reflection, worship is birthed. Worship is birthed. Think about that. That as we reflect and as we pause, something in our spirit is birthed. Worship to God as we see his glory. John, the revelator, as he's called, God gave him a picture into the heavenly throne room. And John saw what was going on. John saw the worship of God Almighty. And he heard what they were saying. And John looks, God gives him this vision of heaven, of the throne room, and John records what he, said, what he hears, and he, this is what he hears. He says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. Would you worship a God that didn't create all things? We're called to worship the one true living God who created all things, and by your will they exist. I want to say it like this. God, as their creator, is the basis for their worship. That's what John witnessed. As Jesus Christ gave him this vision of heaven, John witnessed the basis of worship. You, God, are creator of all things. It's important to reflect upon creation because it reflects upon creator. Again, the context of Sabbath, a crowning act, an incredible gift designed to be a blessing of rest and renewal, a catalyst to worship and, and to give margin, space that gives opportunity for fellowship. Here's the truth about the Sabbath from 
the Genesis passage. Sabbath, it's a day, not a service. One day is commemorated in honor, tribute, celebration of the creator of creation. One day is sacred, so saith God. And ultimately, it is about worship because it gives us space to reflect, to consider the creation of God. Here's the beautiful thing that that Sabbath rest is a beautiful picture of our rest in Jesus Christ. There's tremendous parallels between the two. Rest at creation and our rest in Jesus Christ. Here's a few of them. As Adam and Eve would cease from their labors to enter into the Sabbath, so today believers will cease from their own works to enter into the rest of Christ. Amen? And what I mean by that is is that when we enter into rest in Jesus Christ, what I'm saying by that is, is that we receive by faith our position of righteousness before an infinitely holy God based upon His gift to us. That's what I mean is rest. When we come before God in prayer and we see ourselves through the lens of the work of Jesus Christ, that through Him and Him alone, we are holy, we are blameless, we are above reproach, then and only then can we rest. If it's key to my works, I'll never find rest. And and that's why Hebrews tells us that those who have entered into God's rest has cease from their works as he did from his a beautiful picture of redemption of letting go of our good enough and just falling upon christ and saying jesus in you and you alone i am saved i am holy and righteous and above reproach as god finished his work as creator so christ finished his work as redemption as redeemer you remember God's, God said it was finished, right, in Genesis. And as Jesus hung on the cross, he said it was finished. Interesting parallel. Both give glory to God. Both bring God glory because in him, he is the one. He is the creator. He is the redeemer. Both bring glory to God. They finished the work. Both inspire awe and worship. I want to again go back to Revelation and and again, go to that heavenly throne room where worship is elicited for the Almighty because He's Creator. But also, look at, look at this next verse, Revelation 5. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I want you to hear heaven's worship. We heard it for God as Creator. Now we're hearing it for God as Redeemer. Worthy is the Lamb, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Both rest in in Sabbath as we reflect upon God and rest in Christ as we take by faith our position before a holy God as holy. Both elicit worship. Both are the reasons why heaven is filled with worship because God is creator, because God is redeemer. Amen. If you think creation was impressive, look at the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross to redeem each of us from our sins in bearing the price of sin, the cost of sin, the result of sin. Can there be true worship without rest, without recognition, without pause? So consider then that rest is a catalyst to worship. Amen? Rest opens the floodgates of worship and praise for a holy God as creator and as redeemer. Rest opens those floodgates within us as we say glory to God. Glory to God you created. Glory to God you redeemed. In my hand, as the old song says, I don't bring anything, but I fully lean on Jesus' name. Rest is God's design for you and I. Rest is God's design for you and I. And I would never want to change that. I want to honor God. I want to honor that which is sanctified by God. And 
and by that I honor the one that is the sanctifier. I think we could th see it like this, that when we honor the flag, we're really honoring the nation, right? When we disrespect the flag, we're really disrespecting the nation. And I see a connection between what God has sanctified in recognizing that and honoring the creator, the one who sanctified. What difference does it possibly make today, Sabbath? I believe that the Sabbath is never more uh, relevant than it is today. It's one, it's a timeless picture of our rest in Christ. I do believe that. Two, it's a margin. It gives us space for needed physical rest. It gives us space for fellowship. It gives us space for worship. Amen? It gives us space as we block it out, as we say, God, this is your time. For a world that is restless, it offers space and time to reflect upon God, upon the incredible creative works of God and his works redemptively. On your handout, let me say it like this. Sabbath is our divine empowerment, our divine catalyst, and our invitation to worship. I hope you see Sabbath like that, that it is our divine empowerment. It's God's stamp of approval. You can rest, and it's a catalyst to worship and really an invitation to worship. So let's rest, amen, and let's worship. Worship team, would you come? Let's stand together. From the highest of heights to the depths of the
Father, we thank you for rest. Lord, rest as we enter into Christ. Lord Jesus, even as you've invited men and women and children, Lord, to you, to come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Father, we thank you that rest is a concept that you've woven in to your plan from the very beginning. Lord, that gives us margin, that gives us space. Lord, from our limitless to-do lists. Lord, from the rat race that we call life at times. God, we thank you for loving us and desiring, Lord, to fellowship with us, to know us, to live in us and through us, to enjoy uh, each other, Lord. We thank you for space. We thank you for margin. We thank you for rest. Lord, today we just pray that, that uh, Lord, our hearts would hear, God, what your word is saying. Lord, that there would be no condemnation, but liberation. Lord, that there would be strength and blessing that flows, Lord, from the gifts that you have us. And Lord, that we would never take the gifts and and make them into something, Lord, like the Pharisees did. But God, that we would receive it for all that it's worth. Father, we thank you and praise you for who you are today. Lord, go with us as we, as we depart from here today. Lord, go with us. Be with our families. Lord, be with those that are hurting. Be with those that are confused. Be with those, Lord, that are weak. God, and bring strength, bring clarity, bring healing, Lord, we pray. Father, we pray that you would pour out your blessing. In Jesus' mighty name we ask, amen.